Hi everyone, this is Nick Pollock here from Roar Lions Roar. While you're here, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that alert bell so you never miss any of our new content. And if you prefer to listen instead of watch, make sure you check us out on your podcast platform of choice where you can subscribe and download each new episode. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Go State! Hello everybody and welcome back to Roar Lions Roar. I'm your host tonight, Nick Pollock, and we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. We have not had a chance to talk about Penn State hockey yet, but honestly we should be because they are off to an outstanding start this year. Um, and to do that, we brought back, you know, Roar Lions Roar alum back when we used to write stuff. Um, but our buddy Jacob Cheris. Jacob, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. <laughs> You know, weather is not too great here in State College. It's started to snow, but, um, you know, senior year is kicking off. But, you know, it's been great. Uh, I miss writing for you guys, but, you know, I've found, you know, great content over at Penn State Rivals. So it's it's been, it's been really fun. Yeah, if you hang around to the end of the podcast here, we'll let Jacob rattle off all the places where you can find his work now since – Roar Lions Roar as a written medium is no more. Um, but right off the top here, if you're interested in Penn State hockey, you know, going forward, this team's playing so well. We do plan on mixing in some more uh, hockey content here, you know, especially once football season comes to a conclusion. Uh, we'll probably aim for two a week as far as podcasts go, one about football and one about either basketball or hockey. So we're probably looking at every other week for updates on this uh, really exciting Penn State hockey team. So make sure you are subscribed to the podcast wherever you get podcasts if you're not already so you don't miss any of that content. Jacob, Penn State hockey right now sitting at 10-2. and two. Only losses on the season were a couple weekends ago to, at the time, number one Michigan, uh, and that was 4-3 in overtime, so, you know, no cup, no uh, no cakewalk for them. And then this past weekend lost to new number one, Minnesota, by a final of 3-1 to one after taking the first game in that series. Uh, right now, the Nittany Lions are sitting at number six with one first place vote in the US USCHO poll, and they're actually number four in pairwise right now. If we look at the uh, team leaders, we have uh, tied at the top in points. We have Connor McMenamin and is it Ture Linden? Is that how you pronounce it? Tor. Tor Linden. Tor Linden. Tor Linden. Okay, those two tied at the top with 11 points. We have Kevin Wallen, Connor McCachran tied at 10 points, and then Ben Schoen at 9. Leading the way in goals, we have Wall and Ashton Calder, who we're going to talk about quite a bit today, leading with six uh, six goals. Uh, Connor McCachran has 5, and then Ryan Kerwin and Tor Linden with 4. <clears throat> leading the way in assists we have Connor McMenamin with eight Linden and Schoen and Dowd all have seven behind him and then you know for my money one of the guys I've been waiting to see break out for a while now and is finally doing it uh Liam Soulier or wait oh man we had this debate so many times this is Soulier. Soulier or Soulier <laughs> Soulier Solier, Solier, yeah. Liam Solier having a phenomenal season, a 1.81 goals against average, a 9.32 save percentage, two shutouts on the year. Uh truly been fantastic between the pipes for the Nittany Lions. Uh, so Jacob, as somebody who has been you know, watching this team really closely all season, what are just your overall impressions of the team so far this year? They're fast and they're fun to watch. And Penn State is a team that's always kind of had that fast identity. Guy Godowski has wanted to, wants his team to play fast, up fast and up the rush. But you notice this year compared to last year, there's a noticeable difference in this speed. And you mentioned the two guys, Tor Linden and Ashton Calder. Those two guys have had the hu biggest impact on this team. Tor Linden, so uh last year, so he's a transfer, he's a transfer from RPI. He led the ECAC in points with 39 and was a finalist for ECAC defensive player of the year. This guy got off to a torrid start, no pun intended, um where he was just scoring at every rate that line of Linden at center, Kerwin uh, at the um, left wing and Kevin Wall at the right wing. I believe in the first three series between Canisius, Mercyhurst, and St. Thomas, they combined for 25 points. So wow. that line has been terrific. And there's also been a noticeable difference in the defensive side of the puck. That's something that Penn State hasn't really been known for is its um, defensive play. 2.08. Goals against average, that's the least given up in the Big Ten. Simon Mack, in my opinion, is probably one of the guys that's being underlooked as one of the most improved defensive defensemen on this team. So they're fun to watch. And, you know, I've been enjoying 
seeing them make history. They were the first team in NCAA history to knock off uh, a number one team in consecutive weeks. People were doubting Penn State, sometimes, you know, including myself. I didn't expect them to be doing this well. There, There's depth in all four forward lines. There's a line called, I guess, the identity line with Christian Sarlo, Xander Lampa, Tyler Paquette. The, that line has probably been the best line for the Nittany Lions in these past couple of games. Yeah, so so Jacob, I'm, you mentioned the you mentioned the speed and how it seems a bit different this year. You know, Penn State hockey over the years they typically have gotten off to fast starts. That typically hasn't been a problem yeah. for them. They're usually able to stack wins early on um, easily enough, and they you know. Early on, they're usually good for an, a big upset win or two early in the year. It's usually when we've seen them falter, it comes a bit later in the year. Um, what are the differences that you're seeing right now in this year's team as compared to some of those other teams that makes you think, you know, this early season charge is for real? Yeah, well, well, you know, you mentioned how they tend to get off to a fast start. Some of that you could argue is their non-conference schedule, you know, that the teams they played, Canisius at the start, St. Thomas and, and Mercyhurst, you know, those aren't very strong teams. But Guy Gadowski has always emphasized, hey, you know, last year, you know, we split with Canisius. So they're, you know, they're, they're a good team. We probably didn't deserve to win um, that second game when we did win. Um, in that the, 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 the reason why um, there's a difference in – compared to last year and this year is again, because of the speed, but also you look at the impact that um, over really the chemistry passes have been crisp and guys just, you know, it's been a lot of complete 60 minute efforts in my opinion. And again, like I said, the, the guy is tore Lyndon Ashton Calder. Um, Lyndon, I, I, I've tweeted this a couple of times, you know, in my four years at a, as a student, you know, I've never seen a player impact an entire lineup before, you know, because, you know, the 1920 team, my freshman year, they were extremely talented. Right. But, you know, they had so many guys and Tor Linden has elevated the play of Kevin Wall, Ryan Kerwin, guys, you know, Ben Schoen, Geneva, et cetera. We, I, I haven't seen someone do that um, before. And also a big, um, thing that Guy Gadowski likes to talk about is, you know, last year after um, the COVID season, you know, the culture was just terrible. And, you know, last year they were trying to really build back up that strong Penn State hockey culture and identity. And this year they're trying to focus more on, you know, X's and O's systems, which, you know, I kind of have a little skepticism about that. But um, it's also, you know, a big reason why why they're playing so and also they're just playing the right way you know micah shrewsbury you know, you know the quote gritty not pretty well penn state is exactly doing that they're scoring goals in front of the net the the you mentioned game two against uh the michigan wolverines they were down three nothing in that game and the all three goals that well two of the three goals that they um came back in were in front of the net because of mad net scrambles that's the way this team has to play down the stretch, especially against teams like, you know, a defensive minded team like Notre Dame and especially against a really red hot Michigan State team that has great defense and also better offense. You mentioned um, the improvements on the defensive side of the puck. I want to talk about that just a little bit more because, you know, for um I know you haven't been um, as closely associated Penn State hockey since the beginning of this D1 program like I have, but, um, you know, right from the get go and up until even up until now, like Penn State hockey's calling card is always I've always told people like if you're not into hockey, they're a great team to watch to get into hockey, because one of the things you look for if you're, you know, just trying to get into a sport, well, if you watch Penn State hockey, you're going to see a ton of pucks on net. You're going to see a lot of speed. You're going to see a lot of hard hits. It's basically like the, you know, it's like the run and gun type team uh, that is close to a run and gun type team that hockey can have. But defensively, that's never really been their strong suit. Like they've been known to have lapses along the defensive end and they've had great defensive players over the years, um, but it hasn't quite come together in terms of more uh, 
like a cohesive defensive unit necessarily. So what is it that is that you see is different this year that's allowing them to be more effective on that end of the ice? Well, it's a young core of defense. The, the, they brought in three freshman defensemen that have played a lot of minutes. So Jared Crespo, a guy from Green Bay, he's kind of a, uh, I guess, a more offensive version of Kenny Johnson, who's, you know, he's a physical guy. Uh, Carter Shade, um, if you remember Cole Holtz, he kind of reminds me of that same mold of a two-way guy. You know, has hold, gotten, hold, on, so, hold on, hold on, hold on. If there's one thing that needs to be understood, don't, please never say, do I remember Cole Holtz? Back when we first started talking about hockey in this podcast, I, I hitched my wagon to Cole Holtz before he even signed, and Doug Leeson hitched his wagon to, um, oh, goodness. Uh, uh, oh, Wow. Oh my God, he's gonna. I hope he doesn't listen to this. I'm gonna talk. Well, I'll think of it as you're going. Yeah, the the same style kind of a players. I mean, Shade hasn't really put up the offense. I believe he only has um, one assist so far, and he's had had some injury issues these past couple of games. And Dylan Gratton, the uh, younger brother of Tyler Gratton, Dylan Gratton has been really impressive. But that's the thing is they're a young defensive core. Because Penn State last year, they lost two defensemen and Adam Pillowitz and Clayton Phillips. Um, Paul DeNaples coming back using his extra year of eligibility was huge to bolster up that uh, experience on the back end. So in last year, so they they gave up 3.13 goals against per game in the Big and That was third in the Big Ten. And this year, they've given up the least um, um, amount of goals in the Big Ten. Sticks have been in lanes. Guys have been back checking like. And also, guys, has also been blocking shots. I believe Christian Berger blocked, I think, like eight shots in one game one time or something like that. So he's been terrific. Simon Mack, Dowd is Penn State's best defenseman. He's taken He took a huge step last year, led Penn State um, defenseman with 21 points. Um, so he's he's been excellent, focusing more on his defensive game. Um, and again, that's that's really why they're – competing against these tough teams because if you watch go back to Michigan the first game they shut down their star players Adam Fantilli who is was the nation's leading point scorer coming into that series didn't register a single shot which was incredible to watch they put on a defensive clinic which again is something that we're not used to seeing So that's been my biggest takeaway and why they're winning so many of these games. Sticks have been lanes. They've been playing physical. Guys have been in on the back check. And you're seeing the results now after their best start in program history. Awesome. Uh, Also, Doug, I'm so sorry. Alex Lamoge, that was your guy. I took Holtz, you took Alex You know, I did a – yeah, Alex Lamoge, I I, um, did a – so Tor Linden and Alex Lamoge were actually childhood friends. Um, growing up. So I did a story on that. I got to talk to Limo. Great guy. Um, so, you know, go check that out. So that they, they were, he was a big reason why Tor Linda came to Penn State. Um, you know, he, you know, you're the ECAC leader in points, ECAC defensive finalist for that award. Like, you know, Penn State was lucky to get a player of that caliber. Really, really lucky. And, you know, honestly, like his line has kind of gotten a little stale. Um, a bit, but I think, you know, the more he plays, the better he'll get. And before we dive a bit deeper into Tor Linden and his impact on this team, let's quickly take a break Mm -hmm. here and talk about our sponsor for today's episode, Home Field Apparel. Um, Happy we're talking about hockey here because my favorite shirt from the home field line that they released for Penn State this year was the hockey shirt. Um, If you haven't seen it, make sure you head over to the website and check it out because it's it's beautiful. It's that it's that super old school Nittany line. They made a wrestling one and a hockey one with that style. And it is a truly, truly beautiful t-shirt. Um, but you know, we, you've heard us talk about home field apparel before great sponsors, great friends. They make wonderful, wonderful clothing, sweatshirts, t-shirts, all that stuff. Uh, make sure to tweet at them now and tell them that you need a jacket right now. They're trying to figure out which, uh, which programs are going to get some new, uh, pretty cool looking jackets. So give them a holler there. Um, but as we've talked about, you know, home field, 
they do the work. They look through all that old old marketing material, old yearbooks, all that stuff, find the coolest designs to make the most comfortable apparel out there, not 100% cotton. It's those very, very comfortable soft shirts and stuff you love to wear on game day and any day of the week. And, you know, Christmas is coming up. The holiday season is coming up. This is a great time to buy home field apparel for your loved ones or anybody else special in your life. And if you have never bought anything on home field before, you are in luck because you can use the code ROAR LIONS, ROAR, all caps, all one word at checkout to get 15% off of your first order. If you go in there, you buy a t shirt, a sweatshirt, whatever you want, buy one for everyone in your family, that 15% off is going to come in huge for you. So if you have not checked out Homefield Apparel already, please take a second to go and do that now. Use that code ROAR LIONS, ROAR, all caps, all one word at checkout for 15% off of your first order. And definitely make sure you check out that hockey shirt because, you know, that's why we're here. So, Jacob, Tor Linden. We've said his name a whole bunch already in this podcast, and for good reason. You know, like you said, he's he's kind of revolutionized the play of this team. Um, and I think he's he's really the first of these three breakout players we need to talk about here. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> you've talked a lot about his accolades before he got to Penn State already and how he's kind of changed his line. But uh, how, what is it that, you know, what is it about his play that you think has allowed him to be so effective in the Big Ten, which you know, Big Ten is not an easy conference to play, and you play against some really, really talented players. I mean, just look, Michigan had what four top ten picks last year. Like that was that was mm-hmm. very re- like this is a very loaded conference. And so what has allowed him to be so special? Well, you know, let's throw it back a little bit. Do you remember Brandon Byro? Brandon Byro was a good, yeah. Brandon Byro was a guy that was I watched him his uh, his senior year. Brandon Byro was a guy that was hungry on every single puck, never was so good in the corners, great in front of the net, and Tor Linden is exactly that kind of player, but with probably a little more skill. The way that he's able to come up with the puck in those high-pressure 50-50 battles is so effortless, and also, he's so good at winning face-offs, and that's something that this team Really, really struggled with last year, especially with Chase McClain um, going down with an injury. Uh, Tor Linden right now, 60% in the faceoff dot, 133 out of 87. He's, he's won 133 draws. He just makes it look so effortless, right? And that's why he's been that impact player. Sure, you know, he has great hands. He has a heck of a shot, right? But it's those little things that make him a complete um, 200-foot player um, is why he's, you know, so far Penn State's best player um, is just, again, his ability to hunt for pucks, be physical, and just do it so effortlessly. Like, he just makes it look so easy. Like, and he scored, he was against Mercyhurst, a goal seven seconds into the first period, which is the, which was the fastest goal in Penn State history, in Pagula history, which was, you know, it was remarkable to see that. So it's just his tenacity, and that's why he's been such a successful player so far for this Nittany Line team. As much as I would love to keep talking about him a little, a little bit more, we've talked about a lot here, so I want to move on to yeah. somebody else on the list. It's probably the name that I feel like um, – you know, I, I haven't personally haven't had a chance to watch much Penn State hockey yet this year, but I, I follow along on the Twitter, I follow along on the game tracker when I can. And of all the names that I've seen this year pop up, the the one that I didn't know coming into this year that I feel like I've seen the most of is Ashton Calder. Um, first of all, if you're going to be a hockey player, tough to have a better name than last name Calder for obvious reasons yep. once he gets to the NHL. But um, what has made him so impactful for Penn State this year? Well, Ashton Calder was a guy that came in, again, with a lot of experience similar to Linden. Coming into this season, Calder played 141 career games, which was the third most among active college hockey players. So they were getting a guy with leadership experience and also – you know, so he came from North Dakota, and he spent three years at Lake Superior State prior. These two teams, North Dakota and Penn State, they played each other last year in the Hockey Hall of Fame game where, you know, Penn State beat them. They upset them. And I asked Ashton at the start of the season, why was it Penn State that you chose? And he said, 
you know, I wanted to go to a school where I could believe in this group. And sure enough, he came and Penn State's off to their best start again, program history. Calder, his hands, when I was watching, you know, some film on him when he committed, his hands are so good, man. Like he could put a goalie into last week. Um, you know, leads the teams right now with six goals. Had, he is day to day right now. He did get hurt against um, uh, Minnesota in the first period. So that's a little unfortunate considering how much he means to this team. His whole line is so his line right now, he's on the right side with Connor McMenamin on the left and Connor McEachern, um on, at center. And that line, I asked Guy about this yesterday. He goes, you know, that line overall, you know, has been a bit, you know, snake bitten despite the fact that they've, you know, been playing well. They just haven't gotten the chances up until um, the Minnesota series. So, Calder, to me, what he brings is it, that veteran leadership and that experience that was needed amongst, you know, a young Nittany Lion team that lost a big leader in Adam Pillowitz and Clayton Phillips. Guy will talk about that a lot. And I actually got the chance to talk to some of Calder's former teammates yesterday. I did a story on, you know, how his – prior experience because he's played so many games um, helped him into the player and leaders become today. So that's, that's really the difference that um, he's made. And obviously, you know, on the ice, he's been, he's been kind of that stable forward, you know, McEachern is the guy um, who takes the puck up the ice. Calder isn't really the flashiest guy. He has a great shot and great hands, but he's also one of those guys that is known for doing, like, you know, the, 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 the little things, um, right. And that's again, why Penn state has had, um, this much success is because of those two transfers. They've had such a huge impact. So as you're aware, Jacob, the guys on the ice, you know, forever, they can, they can play their hearts out as much as they want, but it's not going to matter if you don't have solid goaltending on the back end. And like we talked cool. about early on, uh, Liam Soulier has been, Everything that I think Penn State fans hoped for when he first arrived on campus. It took a couple of years for him to get to this spot, but now that he's here, he looks, he has been absolutely phenomenal this season to this point. Um, is there anything that you've noticed in his game that is different than what he's done in the past? Or do you think yeah. this is just a matter of, um, you know, just getting more comfortable in the scheme, understanding his own teammates more and what they will, you know, what pucks they're going to let leak through and which ones they're not like what's going on there. It's absolutely both. And his game, you know, last year he split time with Oscar audio. It was a one one beat tandem. So we are played in the big 10 tournament. He was great. I questioned him at the start of the season. You know, it's his first full season as the presumed number one goaltender because you have a freshman backup at Noah Granite. Um, Soulier's movements, moving from side to side, have been so much more fluid. His rebound control, which is something that he really struggled with last year, has been excellent. He's been more. He's been on top of pucks a lot more. He's been shutting down angles. Like there, you know, there was a goal. Um, that I always point to, um, and it was the very last game of the season, but it was a really bad goal given up by him. It was from like a zero angle. Cause he didn't shut down, you know, his five hole, you know, there was a hole in there. We're not really seeing that from Liam Soulier a- anymore. And also you mentioned the comfort. I'm so glad you did. You know, the more you play, the better you get. And that's, you know, guy has been saying, you know, he just looks more comfortable because of his confidence and the more he plays, the, the, the ex- more experience you get, the um, better you get. And it's valued um, to him. But his, his game, he's just been smarter with where he places his rebounds. He just looks like he looks more calm um, in the net. Unlike, you know, his sh- kind of shaky s- self that, you know, we kind of saw a little bit of last year. But a lot of that, in my opinion, I think had to do was because he didn't really know when he was playing. Because it was a split tandem between um, him and audio. So he's also a huge reason why, you know, Penn State has had great defense because of the goaltending. Because, you know, occasionally they they have a tendency to bring up, to um, let up a couple of high danger chances because they are young in front of him. 
but he's been he's coming up with the saves that are needed to be saved, and occasionally he'll come up with a flashy save on a two on one. So he's been really really good, and hopefully this continues for the junior netminder. So. As well as Penn State has started this year, that doesn't mean that it is a hundred percent all rainbows and good feelings and everything's you know hundred nope. percent where we want it to be. Um, so tell me, tell me what things this team um, has been doing poorly that you think they need to improve on in order to keep this train rolling. Well, if you watch any of their games in the past week, you know it's the power play, and, and this team right here, I'm I've been watching like. For those of you who are well, listening, Jacob is wearing a caps hat. Plays. Yeah, both my teams have had struggling power plays, and it's been hard to watch. Penn State in its last, in its last six games, one for 21 on the power play. One, Yeah, you heard that right. Of only one goal on 21 chances. That can't happen. They've been able to win games without scoring a power play goal. There's no question about it. But then in game two against Minnesota, they were 0 for 3, and this time it cost them. And sometimes, you know, they've had good looks occasionally, but also they they just, I think they're trying to be too, a little too perfect with it. You know, like the, the, the goal of Penn State's power play has been try to get the puck to McEachern on the near half wall so he could, you know, draw the penalty killers towards him so that opens up you know, Calder in the slot, McMenamin on the back door. They just haven't been able to execute that. They know it's a problem. They know that it's a re- big reason why, you know, they're losing games and losing momentum. So th- it, that's really been the dagger for this team. And also the penalty kill. Recently, it has gotten better, but they gave up a power play goal against St. Thomas in game two, and they had like a 8% success rate on the power play. That, you know, that, that's just unacceptable. And part of that has to do with, you know, the discipline of Penn State. Last year, they got in a lot of penalty trouble. Been better at it this year. Um, penalty kill right now is 77.8%, uh, which is uh, below the bottom in the nation. So really, special teams have just been this team's downfall. You know, a power play is supposed to spark momentum but this team, it seems to degrade it. But it's honestly, it, you know, it's better to play well at even strength. But you can't be converting, especially down the stretch against these conference matchups. Just one goal on 21 chances on the power play. That just, you have to convert and make the team on their, on their heels. And also, you know, a common trend, you know, guy was asked about this uh, the other night. You know, they just had kind of a tough time carrying their momentum into game one, into game two. And, you know, yes, it was against, you know, um, Minnesota and Michigan, two very good teams. But that happened against St. Thomas. And St. Thomas, they're playing right now in their second season as a Division One program. They had to take St. Thomas to overtime. Granted, St. Thomas played really well, but, you know, you expect a little bit more and kind of the same game plan and play a full 60 minutes for two um, two full games, I guess. So that's really been um, a, a struggle. It's the special teams and also just hasn't, haven't been able to close out games and just finish them off against teams that they should. not And then, you know, in game two, they had to come from behind and tie the game and they ended up sealing a point, but really it's, 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 it's the special teams that have really, really been struggling um, for this team. Awesome. Please excuse my dog barking in the background. I don't know what he's upset about. Um, <clears throat> so he might Jacob, be upset about the power play too. <laughs> he could be. That could very well be the issue. Um, so Jacob, you know, knowing everything that we've talked about here, all the positives, the negatives, um, taking into account whether you think those negative, whether you think the special teams can be fixed or not. Um, let's just make some. Like I said, we'll be, we'll be back in probably a couple weeks to talk more hockey, but. Just for now, let's make some just general kind of broad predictions about the rest of the season. Now, I'm not going to ask you to like give me a final record prediction or anything like that, mm-hmm. but just overall, do you think that Penn State is going to let's let's even start here. Do you think that this team is going to end the year 
as a top 10 team in the country. Like we said, right now they're number six in the USCHO and number four in pairwise. Do you think they can stay in the top 10 when the season comes to a close and we start looking at uh, Frozen Four rankings? I think they they easily can. If they stay healthy and continue to play the way they're playing, yes, I think they absolutely can stay in the top 10. But you also have to keep in mind, even the 1920 team, Penn State has had a tendency to kind of fall back down the stretch. Teams kind of take advantage of them. You know, they they won the Big Ten regular season that year um, in 1920, but they still, you know, they were swept by Notre Dame. They were swept by Michigan at home in two high-pressure environments at Pagula. So I'm not ready to say I, – I, I'm not sure if they will. Right now, you know, they easily they easily can. Right. And you look at the upcoming schedule this week and they're playing, you know, Michigan State, who's a very, very good team this year. They blew it up and they finally had the offense to back their defensive style, you know, with the new head coach, better goaltending. So can't count them out. And then you have, you know, Alaska non-conference game, Ohio State. Ohio State's a team that has really struggled. And I thought they would get probably second in the Big Ten because they had the best goalie in the Big Ten in Jakob Dobesh, who is 6'4 and covers the entire net because he's so freaking big. So I think with the way they're playing now, yes, I think they could remain a top 10 team. Will they, though? I, I can't really answer that because there's still kinks that need to be worked out. Like I said, you know, the power play and the penalty kill. And also they're, they're – they're, they also have to stay healthy. You know, Calder right now, he's dealing with his second injury of the season. Um, and, you know, we don't know what's up with that and how long he's going to be out for. Penn State recently just got back Chase McLean from a season-ending lower body injury he sustained last year. Um, but, no, you, I think a lot of people have this team in the tournament, um, like their preseason. And the ba- – Big Ten preseason coaches, coaches poll, you know, had Penn State at six, and I had them at six because I just thought the other teams in the Big Ten were better. Like, I just had questions about the defense and um, their goaltending. So I think they easily can. You know, I'm not one to say, you know, I, I don't want to jinx this team and say, yes, I, you know, they'll they'll be remain top ten of pairwise and they'll go to the tournament because, like I said before, that trend of, they, they've had a tendency to step back in the latter stages of the season where points in the pairwise matter. Yeah. Um, how comfortable would you be right now, Jacob? Let, let, let me put it this way. Let's put it in a, in a dollar value. If I told you you could bet any amount of money on Penn State, uh, I guess I'm winning the Big Ten. I don't want to say winning the Big Ten regular season and the tournament. That's a lot to ask. If I had to, how much money would you be willing to bet right now that Penn State wins either the Big Ten regular season title or the Big Ten tournament title? Oh, man, now you're really putting me on. You're the spot. a senior well, in college, so you know money. Money is a very different calculus for yeah. you. You got it. You got to yeah. clutch that tight. Yeah. Um. Well, the thing is, Guy Gadowski has proven to make a lot out of a little. Last year, they upset Ohio State and became the first team in the Big Ten uh, on the road to win a three-game series uh, on the road. And that and last year's team wasn't very talented, and they took a really good Ohio State team to three games, and they, and they came back from behind. Um, so I think... I still think Minnesota has a lot to prove. They haven't been playing as well as they should. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> I, I, if I had to put money on it, I, I, I just think because of the trend that I've said of them falling back in the second half, I, I'm not willing to put money on them winning at least the Big Ten regular season. Depending on how they're playing in the tournament, or when or, and what seed they get, um, that might be a little bit of a different story. You know, it's hard for me to look ahead because hockey's a game where it's a game of momentum. It doesn't matter how much skill you have, 
it's whether you're playing the right way or not. Right now, Penn State's playing the w- right way with, you know, I don't want to say like not a lot of skill, but not, you know, compared to the other teams, the Big Ten, like Michigan, Minnesota, um, Notre Dame. Right. So um, <laughs> if I if I said the way with the way they're playing right now, if the season stopped today and Penn State was going in the Big Ten tournament so they would get a bye, um, I would say yes, I think I think they would uh, win it. Um, it. It just depends on, you know, like I said, the special teams and just how they're playing. I can't I'm not one to say. Um, look ahead so much into the future and say, you know, um, oh, this team's going to do that because I don't want something to come back and bite me, um, if you know what I mean. All I heard here during that hopefully segment, I, folks. Hopefully I got what you wanted. All, all I'm hearing in, in what Jacob just said, folks, is that uh, he's he hasn't been corrupted enough, by, like the rest of us, to start throwing down more and more Correct. sports bets. So, you know, I... One, That's a good one thing. game at That's a time. A one and zero, as James Franklin says. One and zero, as James Franklin says. You got to wait. Take it on a game by game basis. Um, there you go. I'll, I'll, there I'll, you go. I'll, when I, next time, if we do a podcast before the tournament, you know that then then I might be throwing some money out there. Um, okay. Okay. And say like my predictions. All right. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, before we get out of here, Jacob, uh, let everyone who's listening know where they can find your work now since Roar Lines Roar is podcast only. Yeah. Yep. So right now I am writing for Penn State Rivals, Nittany Nation. Um, all my content will be posted uh, on there. You could also follow me on Twitter at J Cheris, C H E R I S 17. I 17. Um, I post, uh, I live tweet every game, um, and that's where also I post some of my stories. Um, I do lots of similar, similar content that I did on Roar Lines Roar, lots of analysis. Features, features is something I'm trying to go beyond just the game of hockey, like those two features I did on Calder and, um, you know, and Linden. Talk to some former teammates there. Um, and I also, you know, so that's where you can find my content, but I wouldn't have gotten to this place and, you know, rivals reached out to me. I wouldn't have gotten there without, you know, roar lines roar. Like that was the pioneer. I, I, you know, when I get out of here, you know, I want to cover hockey, you know, hockey, hockey's my passion and roar lines roar gave me the opportunity to cover the team that, you know, I rooted for my freshman year, um, sophomore year. I did a little bit of coverage and just speak, speak my mind about, you know, the game that I uh, love so much. And I'm so glad to be, continuing to do that over at Penn State Rivals and you know the uh, my another there's another hockey writer on Rivals too Catherine Brody she does great work there as well so Twitter at jchera 17 um find all my content on pennstaterivals.com Nittany Nation they do I think a lot for football and uh basketball recruiting but we're up and up the hockey game um as always Yes, be sure to follow Jacob for the uh, remaining two weeks that are left before Elon officially burns Twitter to the ground. Um, but yes, Jacob, we were we were very happy to have you at Roar Lions Roar while we were still a written medium. It was great to have you, and uh, I heard it. You almost said you almost said the words Roar Lions Roar was a pioneer. I heard it. You can't take it back, and I agree with it. We are true pioneers in the in the world of Penn State media. I, you heard it here first. You heard it here forever. Um, but yeah, we loved having you. We're very proud of what you're doing over there with Rivals. Uh, very happy for you, and looking forward to having you back on the podcast here in a couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, I think that does it for tonight for our Penn State hockey coverage. Like I said, we're hopefully going to aim for p- hockey every every other week or so. Um, you know, depending on what's going here. on. Yeah, depending on what's going on in the seasons. Like if if it was an off week before, but the Penn State uh, the Big Ten tournaments coming up for Penn State hockey, we'll be sure to at least come up come back here and do a little quick hitter on that, whatever it is. Um, but if you enjoy this hockey coverage or football coverage or basketball coverage, make sure you're subscribed to Roar Lions Roar on uh, whatever, wherever you get your podcast, make sure you're also subscribed, also subscribed on YouTube. You can always find us there as well. Um, but that's going to do it for tonight for myself, Nick Polak, for my co-host tonight, Jacob Cheris. Thanks for listening. Go State.